This is International Master Eric Kislik, and I'll be covering the final game, uh, final decisive game of round one in the Candidates Tournament in Berlin. This was a game between Karyakin and Mamad Yarov. Karyakin known for being a very principled E4 player, and Mamad Yarov known for a slightly quirkier style, usually plays sidelines such as the modern Steinitz. In this game, he played what's frequently called the Smyslov variation in the Rai Lopez. Bishop to b5 was played, and then he opted for g6, which has been becoming more popular recently. One of the ideas is that, let's say, white plays d4, take on d4, bishop g5, bishop e7, takes, takes. This is one of the main lines and is actually considered to be approximately equal for black. So c3 is considered to be the main line, and here a6 was played. Um, bishop a4 is the main line here, although I think bishop takes c6 should give white a small advantage, as was played in the game. So takes, takes, and actually what's interesting here is black's main idea right now is to go queen to d3, preventing white from castling. So here he'll either castle or play d4. So he opted for d4, and black took, and white took back. So we can pause for a moment to assess what has happened. Black has the bishop pair. But white has an ideal pawn center, pawns on d4, e4, um, great central presence, and a better pawn structure. But black can play dynamically and exert some pressure against it. So black decided to go for bishop g4. Bishop g7 is also a solid line. Bishop g7, knight c3, knight e7. Black's idea here can be to play h6, g5, and then knight to g6 to give his knight a good square. Um, so we went for bishop g4. And his plan was just to go bishop takes f3 and try to win the d4 pawn. So white went for queen to b3, which arguably is the best move, breaking the pin and putting pressure against the b7 pawn. So black continued his plan, taking and going bishop to g7. It's a tough decision here. Should he play b6 and simply defend the pawn or take on g7, or, or play bishop g7, excuse me. So he went for bishop g7. And uh, white just decided to defend with bishop to e3. White had another way to play. He could also go knight c3, and then if rook to b8, just go knight to e2 to defend the d4 pawn that way. So bishop e3 was played. Black went knight to e7, continuing development and not blocking in the bishop. Knight to c3. So here black decided to go bishop takes d4, which was actually forced because if you castle, 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 here, white can just play h4 next move and has a huge attack. So actually, he had to take the pawn, and here the mistake that Karyakin made was taking on d4. He should have just simply played rook to d1, and then after c5, defending the bishop. He can't play bishop takes c3 check because then queen takes c3, attacks the rook on h8 and the queen on d8. So he goes c5, and then after queen takes b7 castle, knight to e2, if rook to b8, he can just go queen takes a6, and here, white is definitely better. So that was white's only real chance to get an advantage from the opening here. So bishop takes d4, queen takes d4, queen takes b7, castle. And in this position, white played a slightly dubious move, although the refutation is very, very hard to find. Um, one of the grandmasters commenting on the game on ICC pointed it out. So after queen takes c7, he can play the incredible move knight d5 which definitely deserves two exclamation marks simply because it's so surprising. The idea is that after e takes d5, you can go queen to d3, and the white king has nowhere to go. The rook is coming. One of the rooks is coming to the e-file in the next move. So he has to take, and then c takes d5. And here, basically, black is at least slightly better, has a better pawn structure. We'll get to play against four isolated pawns after d takes e4, f takes e4. So knight to d5 was a very nice possibility that was missed by both players. In view of that, white should have simply played rook to d1 and probably rook to d7. So um, takes rook to b8. This was a nice move. I think many players would play too passively here because the, the knight on e7 is attacked. Most players would think, oh, I just simply have to defend the knight. But we can just go rook a to b8, threaten the b2 pawn. So after castles to defend his own king, black simply took and white took on e7, and black took on c3. So basically, a major transformation of the position has occurred. Both sides have five pawns. The f3 pawn is attacked. 
But all things considered, if neither side makes a mistake here, this should be a pretty balanced position. Um, black is not able to advance the C-pawn very far, so that's one of the main reasons why the position is balanced. So king to g2 was played, defending the f3 pawn, and black decided to go for rook c2. So one of his plans can just be to start advancing on the queenside pawns, for example, with c5, c4, or with a5, a4. Uh, white went rook a d1. If he went a4 immediately, black could go c5 and then c4, which seems like a pretty good plan for black. Um, so rook a d1 was played. And now the position became simplified. So after rook takes a2, black is threatening rook a3 with pressure against the f3 pawn. So white with rook c1, rook c2, takes, takes, rook a1. So now he's going to win back a pawn by force because he has queen b7 and both uh, and the a6 pawn cannot be defended. So takes, check, king f1, queen f6, attacking f3, king g2, rook to b8. So here rook to b3 is a threat. So White went for rook a5, which was fine. He could just go queen a3, though, which seems a bit easier. This, this seems a little bit easier to manage. But OK, rook a5 was fine. Rook to b3. And here he simply needs to defend the f3 pawn. And there are a couple ways to do that. He could go queen c8 check, which was played in the game. Or what I think is simpler, just to go queen to e2 and rook to c5. Here I think it's very unlikely that black will win this. But anyway, what he played was still OK. So we went queen g4, and now rook b5 was a nice little move because the rook cannot move from a5, otherwise there's rook g5 pinning the queen. So rook takes b5, c takes b5, queen d7 was played, and then queen g5 checks. So one thing I should say about this endgame is that I actually played an identical endgame against Grandmaster Vokach, and the game ended in a draw. It was a really, really similar pawn structure. I'll actually put it in the description below. But... Um, after queen g5 check, basically what black's trying to do is he's hoping to find a way to keep his king safe, to avoid any sort of perpetual check, while also supporting his b-pawn. But that's not really going to be possible to actually push the pawn all the way down to b2 or b1. So well, we can skip through the next couple of moves. Queen e5's played attacking the h-pawn b4, queen b7, queen c3, e5. This is a nice move. He's hoping for queen takes e5, queen takes b4, leading to a draw. b3, king g2, queen c4. Um, so he's stopping e6. So queen b6, h6, giving the king a little bit of breathing room. King g3, um, queen to d5, f4. So e5 is safe. And so basically white just needs to remain vigilant and not lose any pawns and not allow the pawn to advance too far forward and he'll always be able to he'll always be able to play the move e6 when the move b2 is played which is very important. So for example, he went queen to b8. Um, if he goes queen d3 check and queen e3, he can just go queen b7 keeping everything under control and after queen c4, f3, queen c3, queen f8, queen c4. Um, he could he could just play queen e7. Here's a nice little solution here. If b2, he can go queen b7, queen a2, e6. That's a crucial way to draw. So queen takes e6, queen takes b2, and we have a draw. So basically, white just needs to keep that e6 move in reserve, and then he can always draw in this endgame. So after queen b8, king g7 was played, queen b6, queen d5. And there may have been some, there may have been a simpler way to draw. For example, he could go queen b4 and then queen c3. And then if b2 is played, he can play check and then e7. And then after this, he can just play queen f6 or queen e5 and uh, b1 queen and then uh, e8 queen check. So, um, but what he played in the game should have been able to draw. So, so here queen to b8 was played, queen b8, queen d1. Queen b7, check, king h3, queen e3, king g2, check, king g3. So everything is still under control here. And I think what he missed is that he actually probably didn't realize that he was going to end up in Zugzwang in the actual game continuation because here he can simply play king to h3. And after king to h3, check, check, here he can go king g2. And this is a very interesting case of mutual Zugzwang because after h5, king g3, black is not able to, to make progress here because he does not have the move g5. So in the game, there was the move queen e3. 
And the important point here, after queen e3, is that if he goes king to g3, there's g5. And g5 is winning. And actually, some people mentioned the move king to f1, and this, this position was kind of hotly debated. People were wondering, is this position winning for black or not? And yes, this position is actually winning for black. Um, I can demonstrate one way to, to win. So for example, let's say white just shuffles the king back and forth because he doesn't have anything particularly useful to do. So let's say we get this position here. This, is, this position can be reached by force. And now black can simply go queen g3 check, take, 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 king f5, king f3, takes, takes, and black will take over the opposition, king, f, king f5, and if king to g3, there's king e4, or if king e3, there's king g4. So black has the opposition and wins. So, uh, but in the game, queen b4 was played and black had to move g5. And actually, black did not play this perfectly here. He played check, king g3, and now um, I think he may have missed that he would not end up um, falling into perpetual check after b2. So if e6 now, this is what he may have missed, that he can just check. So after king g2, f takes e6, if queen e7 check, he can go king g6, king takes g5, and king g6, and then just go king h7, and now there are no more checks because he has queen g7 check blocking. So um, he may have missed that he could just simply go b2 here, and e6 does not lead to perpetual check. So um, he took, and you'll see how white could have drawn this. So king g4, queen e3, and here there was simply no need to give up the pawn. He went king g3, but he could just go f4. And after check, and b2, he can simply go check, king h7, queen b3, and as long as he can latch onto that f7 pawn, he'll be able to draw. So here, king, king g3 was played, queen takes g5, check, and basically, black put his queen on the ideal square, and then he brought his king in. So king e3, king g6, king e2, king f6, and so now he simply brought the king over. And king e3, king e6, check, king d7, check, king c6, king c5, and then queen c4 was a nice move, king c6, and then he went queen, king to b5. And so if queen to a8 now, um, you can check, go queen to d4, check, king a6, and white slowly runs out of checks. If queen to c6 check, you can just play queen c4 check. So queen to b2 was played, and king b4, king d2, check, king e1, queen h4 check, with the queens coming off by force, white resigned. Um, yeah, it was a great game by Mama Jaroff. He really put Karyakin under tremendous pressure, and he deserves all the credit for the win. So great way to start the tournament for Mama Jaroff, and uh, we'll see if Karyakin's able to bounce back.